Well, let me introduce our next speaker. Um, and this is exciting for me because it's also a little bit embarrassing. Honestly, I, I don't know if I have the courage of our next speaker. And I'm pretty sure there's a lot of Christians who don't. And she's not a Christian. Um, the Australian newspaper reported that uh, as a mental health professional, a psychiatrist in the children's mental health ward at um, Brisbane Hospital, Queensland Children's Hospital, uh, she walked in one day and management had hung a trans pride flag in the waiting room of the hospital with people suffering gender confusion. So she took it down. Hands up if you would have taken the flag down after management put it up. We've got a couple of people there. Well, you're all braver than me. I don't think I would have done that. That was gutsy. Um, and she said, it's not, nothing, no discrimination or hate. It's just this is meant to be a neutral space for people. It's just not appropriate here. Um, but anyway, um, Gillian Spencer, Dr. Gillian Spencer, is a psychiatrist who has been stood down by the hospital because she said, I want to treat patients as individuals based on the evidence and symptoms and history of the individual presenting in front of me, not with a one-size-fits-all, bureaucratic, government-mandated, unscientific approach. Um, so this is a massive, massive justice issue in our state. Um, and to help us ask really good questions and understand the urgency of this moral emergency, um, please welcome Dr. Gillian Spencer. Thanks so much for having me. All right, just with that trans flag story, actually, um, that, that waiting room was filled with trans flags. It wasn't just one. Um, it's actually incredible. And just I'll, I'll just let you know that what had happened that led me to take down actually a couple of the trans flags was that my team had had a education session run by the gender clinic. And um, so we were, I was in a small team and the nurse from the gender clinic had come in to talk to us about chest, chest binding. And I had found out that my hospital was running chest binding, chest binder fitting sessions for adolescent girls. And I was devastated. <laughs> so that's sort of the background as to why I um, started to um, really feel like I really needed to take action. So um, I've written what I've got to say, um, but I don't want it to be boring and I'm really happy to take questions. Up. There we go. Um, I'll just explain that I'm a child and adolescent psychiatrist, which means that I studied medicine at university and then worked as a junior doctor in the hospitals for a couple of years and then trained in psychiatry, which takes about five years. Um, I did subspecialty certificates in child and adolescent psychiatry and forensic psychiatry and graduated as a psychiatrist in 2009 and started working at the Children's Hospital in 2014. And then it was um, April 2023 um, that I was stood down um, for raising questions about the treatment um, of children with gender distress. So how did this um, terrible mess that um, the hospital's in and it's happening across Australia, how did, how did we get here? Um, so gender dysphoria, you know, the discomfort with one's sex body, um, was previously a rare condition that predominantly affected boys. So historically um, it affected one in 10,000 boys and one in 30,000 girls. And in the 1990s, researchers noticed that the very small number of adults who had undergone medical and surgical procedures to try and appear as the opposite sex had very poor physical and mental health outcomes, things like a suicide rate 19 times higher than the general population. Um, but it wasn't just about suicide. Um, it was also that they had very poor outcomes in terms of drug and alcohol use disorders, um, physical health problems, um, high rates of committing crime and also being victims of crime. And so the doctors um, speculated that the negative outcomes were due to these people not passing as the opposite sex. And so they decided to try and improve the cosmetic outcome by blocking the puberty of children or adolescents um, who were experiencing gender dysphoria. 
Now, that was a really odd move because it was already known at that stage from the 11 studies that had been done that 60 to 90% of children with gender dysphoria become comfortable in their own body through the course of adolescence. And um, a proportion of them end up being same-sex attracted. So the first study on the medical and surgical transition of children was conducted by Dutch researchers, um, and they published their studies in 2011 and 2014. And they studied a group of 70 children who had um, demonstrated a um, cross-sex identification from an early age, and they were considered psychologically stable, gave them puberty blockers, cross-sex hormones and gender surgeries. One of the kids died uh, from the gender surgery, um, and the study had m major flaws, um, which include, included the switching of the, the rating scale used to measure the gender dysphoria. So at the start of the study, they gave the version designed for the child's biological sex, and at the end of the study, they gave the version designed for the opposite sex, the desired gender. And this switching artificially produced the major finding of the study, which was that there, that there was a reduction in the gender dysphoria. I hope that's not too confusing. Um, but the findings of these, um, so the findings of these Dutch studies, for that and for other reasons, are considered really biased and unreliable. But nonetheless, um, the treatment, which is called the affirmation model, was rolled out across the Western world, and it's never been subject to high-quality clinical trials. So the affirmation pathway starts with getting all kids to contemplate their gender um, and introducing them to the unscientific idea that it's possible to be born in the wrong body. Um, so these ideas are introduced at school and at, in, when kids are doing extracurricular activities and when they're online. And then when some of those children develops or presents with gender dysphoria, the affirmation model considers them to be naturally trans or gender diverse, and they're um, encouraged to socially transition. And social transition, as you may know, is when a child adopts um, opposite sex name, pronouns and appearance. And the family are encouraged to support the social transition on the grounds that it's life-saving, even though there is no evidence that any part, that social transition or any part of the affirmation pathway reduces the risk of suicide. Um, the problem with social transition is that it prevents the child from recovering from the gender dysphoria, makes them preoccupied with their own appearance, um, gets the child to feel comfortable pretending to be the opposite sex, and makes it harder for them to return to their own biological sex. Um, and if the child is young, um, and the Australian guidelines talk about going into kindergartens to facilitate social transition. So if the child is young, there's no way of them knowing that in order to continue presenting as the opposite sex, they'll need to later embark on a medical and surgical pathway starting at the very start of puberty, and it is lifelong and has really serious health consequences. So the first medical step in the affirmation pathway is puberty blockers. Um, so they're prescribed at the very start of puberty, uh, which is roughly age 10 to 12. They were originally conceptualised as giving children time to think before embarking on irreversible interventions like the cross-sex hormones. But what is known from their widespread use is that puberty blockers prevent the child from recovering from the gender dysphoria. So instead, um, as um, you might remember I mentioned before, there's 11 studies that show that 60 to 90% of kids recover from gender dysphoria through the course of adolescence. But if children are put on puberty blockers, 90 to 95% of them or more in some studies will go on to take cross-sex hormones. Um, so the side effects of puberty blockers are similar to menopausal symptoms, fatigue, hot flushes, um, actually mood problems um, and weight gain. And they reduce the bone mineralisation at a time when bones should be reaching their peak strength. Um, there's suspected cognitive effects and um, emotional effects because puberty is such an important time for brain development. A recent study at the Mayo Clinic um, suggests that puberty blockers can cause anywhere between mild to severe testicular atrophy, um, and there's an FDA warning label um, on them related to a condition associated with raised intracranial pressure. And what's not been studied, but from the few kids that have come off the puberty blockers after being on them for quite a while 
it doesn't seem quite so easy to just restart puberty once that adolescent window has passed. So if the full affirmation pathway is followed from the start of puberty as recommended, um, the person will be infertile because their ovaries or testes um, won't develop and their genital tissues don't develop, which affects their capacity for sexual pleasure. And depending on their biological sex, the physical health problems from cross-sex hormones vary. So, for example, there's higher um, cardiovascular morbidity for females taking testosterone um, and then higher rates of some cancers and the risk of stroke from blood clots for um, men taking estrogen. And cross-sex hormones also affect fertility and sexual functioning even in those people who didn't have their puberty blocked when they're prescribed after puberty. And there's very high complication rates from gender surgeries. So how did we get this in Queensland? Um, so the Ch Queensland Children's Gender Service was set up in 2017 um, and there was a moderate increase in referrals until 2020 and then the referrals skyrocketed during COVID and the gender clinic extended its hours and did Saturday sessions and video link sessions. And then um, between 2022 and 2023, so really recently, um, the number of children placed on puberty blockers and cross-sex hormones by the gender clinic doubled. So in 2023, the clinic commenced 172 children on puberty blockers and 275 children on cross-sex hormones. They received 406 new referrals and they had 899 kids that they were um, treating as open patients, so essentially 900 kids under their care. Um, they have 11 staff members, so that makes one clinician for 80 patients. And that's really important to note because a normal mental health service, in a normal mental health service, a clinician will um, have about 20 patients or less, depending on the intensity of that mental health service. Um, so if the staff member has 80 patients, we know that they're not providing any mental health input, even though those kids attending the gender clinic have quite complex mental health problems. The clinic has a three-session intake and assessment model before the child will see a sexual health physician for the prescribing. However, when I was working at the hospital, I saw kids who had had only one or two assessment sessions before being put on puberty blockers. But what's important to know is that doctors and mental health clinicians have no way of knowing which children will persist in their gender dysphoria into adulthood. So even if you did 20 assessment sessions, you still have no way of knowing. And so it's never safe to start kids on puberty blockers or cross-sex hormones. So a lot of you may have heard of the CAS review. Um, so I'll just explain a little bit about that. Um, it's the UK's review of their children's gender clinic. It's called the CAS Review and it was released on the 10th of April this year. It started back in September 2020 after a media spotlight was put on the clinic because um, whistleblowers in the clinic and ex-patients um, raised really serious concerns. And that UK clinic was providing care according to the affirmation model, which is exactly the same model that's um, in every single gender clinic across Australia. Uh, senior paediatrician, Dr Hilary Cass, led the review. As I said, the review took almost four years um, and there was extensive stakeholder um, co and community <coughs> consultation, excuse me, um, and the review commissioned um, the University of York to conduct eight systematic reviews of the worldwide research literature to underpin their recommendations. And so what did the CAS review recommend? Number one, um, puberty blockers should only be prescribed as part of a high quality research trial. Part of me is a little bit like, oh gosh, they've had 20 years to prove that these things work and there's a whole lot of ethical problems with puberty blockers. Why would you keep looking for benefit? But yes, nonetheless, it is a much better situation than um, what we have now. Um, they, the CAS review recommended cross-sex hormones should only be used with extreme caution in people under 18 and there should be a clear clinical rationale for not waiting until someone's an adult. And that re reason, that clinical reason for starting early, needs to be reviewed by an independent panel to make sure that it's valid. Um, the CAS review recommended that the care of children with gender distress should return to mainstream child and adolescent mental health services. 
So it shouldn't be provided in specialist gender clinics and the children should receive psychological therapies for their gender distress and the usual evidence-based treatments for any co-occurring mental health conditions or developmental problems. Importantly for schools, the CAS review found that social transition was a concern because it can prevent a child recovering from gender dysphoria. Um, so it's really important that adults don't go around pretending that children have changed sex. And the CAS review concluded that there was no evidence that the affirmation pathway reduced the risk of death from suicide. And importantly, three months after the CAS reviews released, um, we were provided with conclusive evidence that the affirmation pathway does not reduce the risk of suicide because um, in July, the UK Department of Health and Social Care released an independent report by the University of Man Manchester academic, Professor Lewis Appleby. Um, he reviewed the data on suicides by young patients attending the UK gender clinic. And the specific aim of his review was to examine a claim that was being made by the transgender activists. They were saying that there'd been this large rise in suicides since a restriction in pub puberty blocker prescription, which happened following a high court case in England back in December 2020. But this um, review found that there's not been a rise in suicide um, in young gender dysphoric patients since the cessation, since the stopping of puberty blocker prescription. So it's very reassuring that we can stop this, these puberty blockers and um, not see any tragedies. Australia's response to the CAS review has been extremely disappointing. Uh, yeah. um, the gender activists have claimed that Australian gender clinics are different from the UK. Um, they keep claiming that our clinics are holistic and multidisciplinary, and these terms, multidisciplinary and holistic, are exactly the same terms that, it, that were used by the UK politicians in Parliament um, before the scandal broke and they um, couldn't keep sweeping all the concerns under the rug. Um, so the gender clinics keep, um, the gender advocates keep claiming that because Australian clinics staff, uh, include staff from various disciplines, it protects children from a single-minded approach. Um, this is completely incorrect. Um, the Australian paediatric gender clinics have all been set up according to this affirmation model, um, which means that all clinicians in the clinic regardless of their professional background or qualifications, are obliged to only provide care according to the affirmation model. So, for example, a speech pathologist working in a gender clinic won't be conducting communication assessments like they might do if they're working in a general child and adolescent mental health service. What they'll be doing if they work in a gender clinic is um, doing voice coaching to help the kids um, sound like the opposite sex when they speak. So um, some of you may know that um, we've recently had uh, the Queensland Government commission review a review of our own gender clinic. Um, it started in um, December last year and it was due to be completed in April, but they extended the time frame because they wanted to consider um, the CAS reviews, which <laughs> gave us all hope, um, but no. Um, so in the end, um, unfortunately, the evaluation panel decided that um, the CAS review, that they weren't going to include it. They thought it was out of scope for the evaluation. And they assessed the clinic against how well they were meeting the standards of these discredited, activist-written guidelines out of the Royal Children's Hospital in Melbourne. And they benchmarked our clinic against the Melbourne and the Perth gender clinics, which also follow the affirmation model. Um, so the, the report that was produced, they didn't specify how they selected the panel members um, and they didn't recognise any conflicts of interest, but there were seven panel members and four of the members were known to be public um, advocates for gender-affirming care. And the panel consulted a very limited range of people who were associated with the gender clinic and didn't consult with people who were critical of the gender clinic. Um, they conducted an audit of patient care um, over 14 months up to until um, April 2024, and they found that 45% of the kids that ended up on puberty blockers had been prescribed the puberty blockers in the community prior to seeing the gender clinic, which means that there's doctors out there um, prescribing puberty blockers just from their own clinic, which even according to the Royal Children's Hospital Melbourne, activist guidelines is, is, um, is, is not in line with them because they recommend a multidisciplinary team. 
Um, the evaluation found that the our Queensland Gender Clinic for Kids was providing clinical reviews to patients at intervals of two to six months, which confirms that no meaningful psychological therapy was being provided. So the evaluation report concluded that the services provide effective care, um, which aligns with the guidelines, and it recommended that paediatric gender services in Queensland be radically expanded across the state and be provided according to the affirmation model. Um, but despite making the strong statements in support of the gender clinic, the evaluation report made 25 recommendations um, for improvements targeting major clinical and operational concerns in the clinic, which shows that the clinic is experiencing major problems with staffing, staff morale, clinical and operational leadership and connection to other services. And the panel recommended an education, uh, education campaign to convince Queenslanders um, that gender-affirming care is a good thing. So finally, I just want to let you know some legal action that I have currently um, going through the Queensland Industrial Relations Commission, and it's, it's separate from the legal case that I have regarding my employment. Um, with the support of the Human Rights Law Alliance, I've taken a claim of political discrimination against my employer, because at the start of 2023, the hospital executive issued me with a lawful direction stating that I must always use the preferred pronouns of children, always take an affirming approach, and always refer gender questioning children to the gender clinic. So I'm alleging that this, is, this lawful direction discriminated against me because I have got a political belief in biological reality that people cannot change sex. Thank you. Um, so what's important to know is that whilst gender affirming care looks like a health intervention, it's actually a political movement. Advocates for gender affirming care appear to have a vision for society which promotes individual autonomy as its highest aim, even in children, and a society that's more diverse, less traditional, and places um, less value on biological relationships. And as you're probably aware from the Olympics and the Tickle versus Giggle case, it, um, these gender beliefs have consequences like women not being able to have their own spaces and sporting category. So just before I finish, I'll just explain what it was like when I was working in the hospital and I was being told that I must take a gender-affirming approach to the troubled and traumatised children and adolescents with gender distress that I was seeing as patients. And my preference for these patients would have been to provide extended psychological therapy and to treat any co-occurring mental health or developmental conditions. It's important that I start by explaining that providing psychological therapy is a craft. It's a skill developed over time, built slowly through learning psychological th theories, um, watching other people provide therapy, having some experiences of therapy yourself, but mostly good therapists develop through the learning that takes place day after day in providing therapy. In the course of doing that, the therapist takes the time to reflect on their interactions with patients, notice what they might have missed, reflect on the rapport and how it's developing or changing, and think about what might need to be explored further and when and how. Therapy isn't like normal conversation, or it shouldn't be. Um, in normal conversations, we intuitively notice social cues and respond to them. So for example, if someone is um, uncomfortable about something, we let them off the hook and we change the subject, and that's considered manners. But in therapy, the therapist will notice the discomfort, slow the conversation down, and make a careful decision about whether to acknowledge the discomfort or not at this time, and they might consider whether to take a circuitous route towards that topic or not, maybe at a later date. And this is all done for the purpose of helping the patient. Whilst doing exploratory therapy, your whole job is to help the patient understand the factors influencing their thoughts and feelings. And some of those thoughts and feelings are uncomfortable for the patient to think about, to share and to stay looking at. So there are kids out there that have been through hell and they come through the doors of the public health system. So say, for example, when I meet a 13-year-old girl 
who grew up with an alcoholic mother and an absent father. And we've got reliable information telling us that from when she was a toddler until she was the age of 10, she essentially raised herself day after, a day, day after day while her mother was passed out on the couch. And we have reliable information that, we saw her, that, that she saw her mother being beaten up by a boyfriend. We don't know what she herself has gone through, but in the last few years, she's gotten onto the internet, internet into anime, and she loves TikTok. She's developed tics like a lot of um, other adolescent girls because that's on the internet too. And then she tells me that she's really a gay man. If that girl is my patient, I don't want the hospital to tell me to put my craft away, my craft of providing psychological therapy. They should not make me start with the premise that this girl is naturally trans or gender diverse and that I need to go along with the idea that she should go to the gender clinic, that blocking her puberty and taking cross-sex hormones and cutting off her breasts is going to make her feel better. Those are unproven and risky interventions. The hospital shouldn't make me pretend that she really is a gay male and pretend that it's possible for people to change sex in order to help her. She's 13 and it's not what a good therapist does. I need to be able to slow things down and do my best to help her understand what she's thinking and feeling and how it might relate to the experiences she's had in the world. I need to help her to connect to the parts of herself that she likes. I need to consider the influence of the people around her and the systems around her. It is important that I don't collude with her and go along with the idea that she should transform herself into a man to escape her fears of what it means to be a girl and one day a woman. I need the Queensland Children's Hospital to let me help her to try to come, become comfortable with the reality of her own body. That girl needs me to not have my hands tied behind my back by Children's Health Queensland. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yes, yeah, so the hospital really needs to let me do my job. Um, and let me be open with the clinical team that I work with that I think her depression and anxiety and self-loathing and fear is driving her wish to transition. Most importantly, I need to be able to say that I don't think transition is the right way forward for her at this time. So um, just lastly, I want to encourage you all to engage with your local member of parliament to express that you want the recommended recommendations of the CAS review um, implemented in Queensland including the return of treatment services for children with gender distress to mainstream mental health services rather than through a specialist gender clinic. We really need to get the gender clinic shut down. Yeah. Yep. Also, I think people should talk to their local member about taking action to prevent gender ideology taught in schools um, because it's really important that children aren't inculcated with this unscientific belief that it's um, possible to be born in the wrong body and that it's possible to change sex. Thank you. Thank you, Gillian. Very inspiring. Hopefully uh, a few Christian pastors take a leaf out of your page. Oh, thank you. Uh, so, yeah, what would, what would you like us to do? Um, will you implement the recommendations of the CAS review in Queensland?